Hey everyone, welcome to Locked on Lakers for Wednesday. Brian Kamenetsky and Andy Kamenetsky. The Lakers lose their fifth straight preseason game, but more importantly, Andy, the big three, Russell Westbrook, LeBron James, and Anthony Davis all played, and they made some impressions. We'll talk about what they did and what they didn't do next. You are Locked on Lakers. Your daily Los Angeles Lakers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I want to thank everybody for making Locked On Lakers your first listen of every day. We post these things in the wee hours of the morning, so uh, it's there and ready for you every day, Monday through Friday. Um, and also remember to subscribe to the Locked On Lakers YouTube channel as well. Breaking news, the pod generally goes up there early, um, so Great place to get a lot of Lakers information. Take part in the Locked on Lakers community that is building up around this show, Andy. Really built already. Um, so we thank you for that. Um, all right. So the final score, not that important. It was 111 to 99 on Tuesday night. Um, the Lakers, though, Andy, they take the floor with the big three. We finally saw the debut of the big three LeBron James, Russell Westbrook, and Anthony Davis. And uh, it was a it was a little while in coming, and I was excited to see it. Yeah, I mean, look, it obviously was not perfect, both in terms of the way the three of them executed together, and also just you know they didn't win the game. Although I right. will say now at this point, zero and five, I'm rooting for them to lose Thursday against Sacto because one and five is lame for the preseason. Zero and six, that's bold. Yeah. Like that's a statement. Man. It's controversial, is what it yeah. is. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the, you're just you're setting a mark at that point. Like, I feel like you're laying down a marker to the rest of the league. Like, yeah, zero and six. Like one and five. It's I mean, it's, one and five is forgettable. And especially too, it's like some teams only play four preseason games. It's like you know what? Screw you guys. Like we are yeah. so confident in our abilities to win a title. We're not. We're going to lose six preseason games. Yeah, not just four. It's just more um, memorable. One and five yeah. is like uh, they they just shit the bed during the preseason. <laughs> what's funny <laughs> about nothing else? It's true. What's what's funny about what uh, Tuesday's game was? You know, we got we've been waiting to see kind of what this could look like when everything was put together. And everything also includes other players on the roster. Um, we were sort of robbed of that as uh, NBA observers because while the big three were playing, obviously Talon Horton Tucker had thumb surgery this week. He's out. Trevor Reza had ankle surgery last week. He's out. But Kendrick Nunn also sat. Wayne Ellington uh, sat with a hamstring problem. Yeah, and it, Malik Frank Monk, Vogel, Frank Malik Vogel Monk obviously really has, has, the, has the groin. Nunn right. was an ankle, you said? Yes, it was an ankle uh, ankle sprain for Kendrick Nunn. Uh, there's been no indication of severity with him like specifically, but I, I think there is at least optimism that both Monk and Nunn could be available for the opener. And, and I, think they're hopeful, I, mean, I think they're hopeful about all three. Is yeah, what I, was Frank Vogel during the broadcast. Frank Vogel said before the game that if this had been an actual game, Ellington likely would have been able to play, but there's mm -hmm. no reason to put him through that. Um, that being said, though, I did think that the the starting lineup of this game, which was the big three, Mello and Bazemore, could be a credible starting lineup with everybody available. I'm not saying it's necessarily where they would go, but I thought it's an interesting lineup with AD at the five. And one of the reasons that I thought it actually could work, and this was something that made a big impression on me watching the three of them together they made good on a lot of the talk that we've been hearing about the emphasis to run. There, there. I would say at least half of the possessions, probably more, with the big three out there, either were in transition or semi-transition. And you could just see that emphasis of we are looking to go whenever we possibly can. It doesn't necessarily mean like, you know, show times, you know, seven seconds or less type pace. But they are definitely looking to push when possible, get themselves to the other side of the court as quickly as they can. And they often looked, even in a somewhat raggedy, getting to know each other state, they looked impressive doing it at times. Like, uh, yeah, it, I thought, particularly in the first half. I mean, they 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 were yes. in the first quarter was really the best part of that. The you know the Lakers were very aggressive. I thought defensively, uh, which is obviously a key part to getting out in transition. It did help the Warriors could not hit a shot like could not hit a shot no. until in fairness really it's quarter. because they were only playing their crappy players 
true. <laughs> um, although they, like they Jordan Poole, Jordan Poole, you know, Iguodala, who's like a hundred years old, <laughs> and Damian Lee, and then a bunch of dudes. Like there, there Iguodala one... is so old, he'd be old on the Lakers too. Yes, like that's yes, he, that's how yes, old he Iguodala is. Yes, he would be. <laughs> like it's <laughs> it's basically like him and Udonis Haslam are the only guys left that. Uh, you know, the, the, the rest the, of the team can call Grams. You, you know Palinka sitting in his office going, those are my white whales. Like, I got to go get those guys. Like, uh, Haslam's going to be difficult, man. Yeah, uh, It's going to be it's difficult true. to pry that dude away. It's true. Um, uh, but, you know, but I, I agree with you. I think th- that was clearly the emphasis, and it, it was there both defensively and, you know, using defense to push um, to be able to go that way. LeBron spent a lot of the first quarter going downhill. Oh, you know, yeah. Push, you know, getting into the lane, whatever. He and Westbrook, both, I don't know if you want to talk about this now or we can get to it, both of them missed shots inside that you would expect them to make or certainly hope they can make for guys who spend as much time at the rim as they do. Um, Le- in LeBron's case, I guess there's always a little bit of concern because his finishing last year around the rim was down comparatively. Um, yeah. I, I, but it overall, got, got I think better. they're... I just think, oh, let's finish. I think overall, the I, the fact that both of them were able to get downhill and spend so much time doing it. I am in the fifth preseason game willing to ascribe a lot of that, the misses to rust. No, yeah, well, I mean, either that or just they're really old. I mean, it's, it's, it's one or the other. Like, you know, they are just incurably old or it's rust. If memory serves, actually, all kidding aside, like LeBron's finishing last season actually got better as the season went mm-hmm. along. So hopefully that's just the case here where, you know, it, it takes a little while to warm up. <laughs> well, it takes a little while to warm up, but you know, I, I I preface this by saying I don't know for a fact that this is the case because I've not heard LeBron specifically address this. But just you know, from our time covering Kobe, like I remember pre Achilles, Kobe used to talk about how he could still hammer down dunks when he needed to, or really attack in the lane when he needed to, like you know, in the season or two leading up to the Achilles, where everything changed for him, but. As he used to say, I only got so many of these left in me, so I have to preserve them. I have to use them surgically. I have to figure out the right moments where I will look like, you know, if not number eight, Kobe, certainly the younger version of 24. And you do wonder with LeBron, like, okay, how much of that burst am I actually willing to Mm -hmm. expend during the preseason? What's you know what worth I mean? It, like, what's not? And also, too, I think there are moments when guys are clearly working on shot. LeBron, you know, there are times when he could maybe probably be more aggressive taking the basket, a bunch of turnaround jumpers today. Like, there are things that he goes in. I want to get that shot in, in a game and get that rhythm and work on certain things that might be different choices in a regular season yeah. game. But overall, I thought LeBron looked strong. Um, Westbrook looked definitely better. I thought this was easily the best of the three games that he played. And, you know, it was hard. Like, you know, getting a feel for everything like we were talking about was is difficult because you don't see the rest of the roster around. It's not just missing one guy or two guys. You're missing five players that are theoretically, and DeAndre Jordan didn't play. So six guys who, in theory, um, five and a half, are part of your, you know, definitely regular rotation aren't there. Um it, that impacts the way the other three play together. But I, you know, there were moments where you could see how this was going to benefit everybody. Russ pushing up the floor, finding Anthony Davis for, you know, a couple easy looks, you know, helping AD draw fouls. And uh, generally, both of those guys drawing attention away from Anthony Davis uh, in ways that were super beneficial to AD. <laughs> you know, it's funny. You, you mentioned AD because of all the guys we mentioned who were out. Rajon Rondo got more minutes than he often might during the preseason, frankly, than with everybody available, we both think he could get during the regular season. Well, he'll play a little bit more than he would with THT out for you know a month or so. And we'll get to uh, the, some of that news, which came out on Tuesday, which could be relevant for this. You know, some of these conversations. We'll try to sneak that in before the end of the show, but he's going to play a little bit more at the beginning of the year. Rondo, I, I'm telling you right now, as long as Anthony Davis is in this league and you are looking to serve him up lobs, Rondo could be 55 years old and get a job in the NBA. Like that guy can throw lobs to Anthony Davis blindfolded in his sleep. It's like, insane. It, it, it really is. Like the, I, I, that, Here's my theory, Andy. They, the Lakers need to figure out a way to change the regular season to something that starts with a P. 
because we all know playoff Rondo is a thing. Apparently preseason Rondo is a thing too. If you, if you look at, at Tuesday's game, nine rebounds, five assists, um, and only one turnover. So yeah, so there's gotta be something that can be done in the regular season to, to make this work. Um, one of the questions though, that I asked that I was looking forward to, to seeing in t- Tuesday's game when we did, um, you know, the show for, for yesterday was the effect that playing with the big three had on Davis, like all those guys together. And given what he's done in the preseason, it's definitely worth focusing on AD for a couple minutes. So let's do that next. Locked on Lakers brought to you by Sweatblock. There's a few things in life just not fun to talk about, and one of them is excessive sweating. Like when you are sweating through your shirt profusely for no particular reason, it's like 70 degrees out, and that is embarrassing. I don't ever have to worry about that. Mm. So that's why I use Sweatblock antiperspirant wipes. That's stronger, more effective than most clinical antiperspirants. You simply apply it at night before bedtime. Next morning, you wake up, you wash, you go about your day, and you don't have to worry about sweat. You can use this once or twice a week. That's it. And stay dry the entire time, guaranteed, or your money back. So there's no more pit stains, no more picking out your wardrobe based on what's going to end up hiding the sweat better. It's like there's only so many times you can wear navy blue and black. Like you, you got to have a little more variety. And Don't sweat wear them block. together. That is not no. a good look. No, it is not a good look, but if you're a profuse sweater, sometimes you feel like you got no choice. Sweat block, though, is your answer. And I'll put it to you this way. If you know of another sweat solution that is doctor-created, doctor-recommended, featured on Rachel Ray's show, and tested by firefighters, I'm open. I'm listening. But until then, check out Sweat Block. Get it for 20% off at sweatblock.com using the promo code Locked On or at Amazon and CVS. 20 points for Anthony Davis on Tuesday, 7 of 12 from the floor. Uh, six rebounds, two assists, two steals, two blocks uh, in 30 minutes. So he played a, a relatively full game. Uh, the other number that really sticks out to me, Andy, nine trips to the line. I think he had 11 the other the other yes, night. Yes, he did. Um, yes, he did. So 20 free throws in the last two preseason games for Anthony Davis. By the way, he's hitting them at a, at a better clip than he did last year, too. Um, this is very encouraging. Both the playing through contact, like he really does look – physically bigger, physically stronger, and the amount of shots that he's going to be able to get at the rim, both in transition or we saw the lobs from Rondo. The Lakers ran very effectively the little dribble handoff with Anthony Davis in the sort of the mid post, handing off to Rondo, handing off to Westbrook to create shots that way. little two-man action uh, that is very difficult to defend. But, I mean, Davis looks good like he he is ready to start the season good um it looks like i think the guy that we sort of expected last year i it's it, i don't want to i don't want to get too it's preseason but like sure. I, I test aggressive he's doing all the stuff that we wish he was doing last year well i i think also though it's just become incredibly clear how much the extended off season for the lakers because they went out in the first round you know, they got what is essentially a normal calendar offseason for a team that goes out early. And while that's obviously not what you want while you're defending a championship, we talked about this, you know, pretty soon after they got eliminated. If they were not going to win the title, they it is definitely in everybody's best interest that they went out early. You can make an argument. I think that it, you should have lost in four. If you're going to lose in, in six, lose in four. Right. Or, or, you know, don't make the playoffs at all. I was going to say that. You you could make an argument that when it's all said and done, had they have lost that play-in game to the Warriors, it really might not have made a real tangible difference in terms of uh, yeah. just I mean, the, who the cares. Or whatever. You're right. Because ta- functionally, if you're not going to win a title with that team, getting to the second round or the third round of the – now look, they if AD doesn't get hurt, they, they have a I, – right. I, I still but, maintain they win that series. But your basic point – and like we didn't talk about this uh, on on Monday's show, or even really get a chance to on Tuesday because the THD news um, made it so busy. The calendar year for when they won the title was this week. It was a year ago, this week that the Lakers won in the bubble. They played. They finished that season, played an entire seventy-two game season, and have come back for another one in a calendar year. That is insane, and shame on me for not recognizing the way that that would impact somebody like AD coming out of the bubble and into the regular season. I mean, not that much shame, but like, I just, I didn't, 
I, I well, wildly underestimated the impact that it would have specifically, I think on him given yeah. his, his personal history with injury and, you know, just nicks and knacks and the physical stuff that goes along with it. He needs an off season more than anyone. Well, you know, it's funny because he, he, you think on the surface without, without really digging into it, you feel like he's the guy that would need less of an off season than LeBron because LeBron has way more mileage. He's correct. You know, he's been at this point, at that point, like, I don't know, nine, 10 finals, whatever it is. I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but like, and what LeBron is doing right now at this stage of his career with this much mileage and this much responsibility, it's literally unprecedented. Like there is no correct. template to compare it to. You are correct. So you would figure that LeBron would be the one. And, you know, LeBron had joked about this when he did that interview um, with Barack Obama that, you know, he was going to spend the first half of the season cherry picking and letting Anthony Davis handle all the work in the first half. And the part about that that I specifically forgot about with AD is that that finals run was by far the longest playoff run Anthony Davis had ever been on. And, you know, the turnaround. And he got hurt during it. Sure. He was not healthy when he was playing. Right. But, But specifically, though, the idea of going through something that long that is so physically, emotionally, mentally taxing and, you know, it's difficult under any circumstances, much less that quick of a turnaround. I think the having never done it before factor with Anthony Davis yep. snuck up on him, certainly snuck up on me in ways that I think either one of us didn't expect. But he it's very clear watching him during this preseason, hearing him talk you know, after practice, after games, he's he is really taking seriously the idea of using this to help reestablish himself that like every single question there's every single part of this is a process yeah and it's not just a process of getting the lakers on the best page possible together it's part of a process of reminding everybody i'm anthony effing davis like reminding everybody and and i don't want to say reminding himself because i think he really I, i don't think he's one of these guys who needs that kind of conference room but like you know the expect he holds himself to a very high standard. Um, and while I think sometimes he is too deferential in his play, I don't want to say passive. I want to, I mean, I, I think deferential is a better word. And by that, I mean, deferential to sort of the quote unquote rules of the game, like making the right play, the right pass, making sure you're not, you know, overtaking games when you have LeBron James and now Russell Westbrook and doing it in a, in a way that's not constructive. Um, but he 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 holds himself. He believes he is one of the three or four or two or three or best players in the NBA, and and absolutely wants to show it. Let's let's talk really quick about Russ because there's, there are some process things that came out in the post game. Uh, guys answering questions that I thought were were interesting. I know you agree. I you know the blueprint was there. I think for how Russ can play. Shots, some of the shots didn't go down. The one three he made was a catch and shoot, which is, as Frank Bogle said, a shoot around on Tuesday. The one he's got the green light for. Um, I think a yellow light would be better, but okay, you've got to do it a little bit. He didn't overshoot the ball. Uh, passing was there, um, you know, kind of fitting in offensively without forcing stuff. It was more the defensive attention to detail, the back cuts and stuff like that that got him, has gotten him in trouble. But overall, you could see absolutely 100% see how this works. Yeah. I mean, he, he's he had five turnovers on the night, but at least one off the top of my head was offensive, and there may have been a second one too. He, I think and he a was couple, just, I, one. I think there was at least one that wasn't really him. I think it was, it was, I forget who he was passing to, but it was a you know, mistake on the other end. Right. I mean, he just, I, I thought it was a game where he was more under control mm-hmm. um, and, and just more settling into who he is with this team. I think it's really helpful for him in particular in in figuring out the best way to, you know, to be himself because, you know, as much as it's cliche when, you know, ever teammates talk about a new guy saying, you know, we need him to be himself. The truth is as much as Russ is going to have to adjust with Anthony Davis and LeBron and this new setting, you, the idea of having somebody completely reinvent themselves that is Russell Westbrook. Like that's pointless. Don't do it. And it's like, and you don't want to. You don't want to take right. you 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 try to figure out the, the way to maximize the the 
the best that he can do and, and without because you can't it's not that you don't get a guy like Russell Westbrook and then try to reinvent him. It's, right. it's stupid. But, but he was three and nine from the field, which obviously is not a good uh, percentage. But I don't think he took many, if any, from when I was watching it, irresponsible shots. There I weren't really one. any shots where you looked at it and you're like, dude, come on, man. Like that, that's just a bad. I saw, if I remember correctly, there was one, you know, early clock pull up jump shot. Right. But without I mean, that. But I mean, he is Russell Westbrook. He's right. Gonna, exactly. Know. I mean, and, and sometimes, you know, watching Westbrook over the years, you know, for better or for worse. And, you know, the last few years, it's been more worse than better. But occasionally it still goes like I I've noticed Russ has this habit where he will start going to the elbows. And he'll start looking to pop up for those jumpers. And early in Russ's career. He was pretty money. Yeah. Oh, it, that was to me always the sign. When Russ would start hitting those elbow jumpers either side of the free throw line, you were done. Like, yeah, you because now you have, to, you have to come out and guard that right. play. And now he's going to go walk right by you. And he, he still takes that shot. But the percentages for those mid-range shots yeah. have gone. have just plummeted over the last few oh, years. Oh, absolutely. The, the returns are diminishing. He's going to have to pick his spots more. And, and I thought in this game... He did a better job overall of just picking spots, period. But you really, though, got the idea of just how deadly the idea of both Russ and LeBron operating in transition with Anthony Davis as a rim runner and guys who are capable outside shooters, either in the case of Baysmore more often like flaring into the corners or Mello often as a trailer. Right, or when those guys get back, Monk, Ellington, like... This is where the supporting cast becomes like those guys yeah. aren't around, but but like you know what I you saw more of how this is going to work again, and I know this is what we're going to end up talking about after the next break. There is a lot that still needs to get figured out in turn in terms of just the best version of this. Well, because I think and this is the hardest minutes. Like you could tell a difference between. Westbrook's freedom when he when LeBron's off. Anthony Davis played almost exclusively always with one of those two guys. Um, you know when the big three wasn't out there together. The easier minutes for Westbrook by far are the ones where LeBron isn't there. In terms, I'm not saying the most productive minutes for the Lakers. I'm saying the easier minutes for Westbrook right now are when LeBron is sitting and he's playing with Davis because that's a two man game. It's a uh, a big like he really hasn't had and that kind of dynamism and he can run point he can throw the lobs he can all that. it's it's the figuring out stuff particularly in the half court when lebron is there what do i do when i don't have the ball what does lebron do when he doesn't have the ball all that off ball stuff things we've talked about throughout the preseason those are the those are the hard parts to figure out and when they were asked all of them repeatedly after the game so how long is it going to take for this stuff to come together they all had a, the int- an interesting and correct response. We'll talk about that next. Locked on Lakers brought to you by Built Bar, the best tasting protein bar ever. Bars covered in 100% chocolate, soft, easy to chew, and they are healthy. They're great for health conscious people. If you're trying to lose or maintain weight, they are low calorie. They're low sugar, high protein, high fiber. They're great for the keto crowd. And as always, they taste great. You got the original flavors, including raspberry, coconut almond, salted caramel, banana bread, new flavors like cherry bar, sea, lemon almond, cheesecake, cookies, and cream. They're perfect for people like me who just love cool, interesting, unique, not boring taste combinations. So go to BuiltBar.com, use the promo code LOCK15, you get 15% off your first order. Again, promo code LOCK15 for 15% off at BuiltBar.com. So Andy, on my calendar, I had circled December 17th as the answer to the question of when will the Lakers and the big three figure it out? I had actually I had come up with a date. It was, the answer was December seventeenth. I was apparently wrong. According to Russell Westbrook and LeBron James and Anthony Davis, there is no date. It's mm-hmm. not something that's going to happen on a specific. No matter how many times we ask, how long is it going to take? When is it going to come together? And all that, there actually isn't a specific answer that these guys can give. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting, Russ. Um, a lot of these guys have been talking about just the importance of process. And that, you know, th- this really is going to take some time to figure out when, in terms of getting to like the maximum ceiling of this team, whatever you think that is. And R- Russ was asked, you know, like even acknowledging that, like, you know, how, how long do you expect this is going to take? Like, you know, how, how long do you think it'll take to just really start clicking if, if not meeting, you know, like that highest ceiling version of yourself. Right. And in so many words, 
Russ said, look, none of us know. I mean, none of us truly know, but I do know that it's not October 18th. It doesn't have to be, it does not have to be October 18th. And I guess sort of unintentionally proving Russ's point, he was referring to the date that the Lakers open against the Warriors. That's actually October 19th, not October 18th. So (laughs) Russ revealed like, he doesn't even know the damn calendar of this. Well, game. shit. I mean, geez, like, LeBron. LeBron was asked, you know, like, how does this set up for Tuesday and this? And he said, "What's Tuesday?" Like, he. Yeah. I mean, none of these guys know when anything happens. Right, but you know, it, that will strike. I know some Laker fans as them evading a question or you know, like not taking full accountability for what's in front of them, like or you know, throwing out cliches. Honestly, that's the actual true answer like that's the most honest version of the answer because none of them actually know but the truth is as as awesome as it would be if this team came out of the gate like the 2020 championship team which you and i both thought would be very very good but we thought would take more time i was very surprised by how right for for that matter actually last season's team first half they came out of the gate very, very good, despite having more new pieces. Right, and my expectation, my, my thought was for this team, at least before the injuries, was they could do the same thing because the early season schedule right. is very home heavy and relatively soft on from an opponent's standpoint. But either way, though, like it isn't mandatory. It's great, like it's awesome if for whatever reason mm-hmm. all these new pieces together just for whatever reason, and you can just start building off that foundation. ASAP, like, you know, that is obviously the utopian version of this. And it's it's what you would prefer, but it isn't mandatory. And, you know, like Mello has talked about this. LeBron has talked about this. Russ has talked about it. Rondo. There are going to be times where this stuff is frustrating, like not just for the fans watching, for them. For them. Playing. Absolutely. And these guys have talked a lot and it came up again um, tonight about the importance of communication and about the ability to talk with each other candidly and honestly. like they, They're they describing this whole season like it's basketball meets group therapy, like in the best possible way. Like you, you can tell that these are guys, at least so far early in the process, this stuff can be easier said than done, you know, when, when you're knee deep in it. But these guys seem to have enough respect for each other to include the honesty. Well, you, you, can't, really you can't do it with any other way. Like if they, if they're, if you want to be able to go through this process relatively quickly and you have to be able to, to reach the level that they're trying to reach, you have to be able to tell each other exactly what you think is working, isn't working and have those conversations in a way where it's not going to result in a fractured locker room. Like it just, it won't work. I mean, the other thing that I think is is instructive about this that that answer that Russ gave that LeBron has been giving that AD has been giving is there is no answer to the question because it's not linear. There are certain things that are going to to work faster and better with the big three than other things. There are going to be some things that take a long time. There are certain things that are you know and and overall like it's not like there's a a finish line where they've reached the maximum goodness that they can get as a group. Like there's always more improvement. I think what we're talking about here is ceiling. Like how close can they get to whatever the topish end, realistic topish end that you know that that's achievable for a group in one season that's this talented. And similar to the Lakers as a whole, the amount of time that they may or may not spend together if somebody gets hurt, the amount of time that this supporting cast isn't there. All of these yeah. things are just things that potentially impact where that ceiling is. Yeah, I mean, we've But they're exactly right. There's no there's no answer to that question, which yeah, is why I mean, it's we, an annoying one. Right. I mean, we've talked about how the amount of guys that they've had in and out of the lineup and, you know, the decision that I, I imagine is just sort of, a, you know, a, a executive decision when it comes to LeBron, AD, and Russ, how much they do or don't play mm-hmm. – you know, that has in certain ways put them behind the eight ball in terms of just trying to overcome that lack of continuity because they they are dealing with an extreme lack of it. But, you know, they just this this stuff is tricky. Yep. And 
that doesn't the way we're talking about it doesn't mean that you shouldn't care about what's happening or if things are going wrong, you don't just blow or it that off. it doesn't matter or that losing right. or games or a lot of it doesn't have an impact like where you finish. I mean, these things do matter. It's not right. that it's unimportant, but you ultimately have to look at, I think each thing that comes up and say, okay, this is what's going wrong right now. How solvable do you find it? Like on a scale of one to 10, how solvable a problem is this with the guys that they have? And then how long do you think is an acceptable time to figure it so out. Do you have and enough then, time? Because last year they ran out of time. Right. Well, well here's to the some thing degree. too. Here's the thing too. There are certain issues that sometimes never get fully solved and you end up winning it all in spite of that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the Lakers shot very well from outside in the bubble at times, but the truth is they weren't lights out either. Like they, no. they just shot better than they had in the regular right. season. It, yeah. And, and that was good, good enough, enough. If you're good enough at certain things to overcome those other things, nobody's good at everything. Um, real quick, I, I, we, we'll, why don't we save the the bulk of how this impacts potentially what they do with the roster and lineup combinations and all that for tomorrow's show? But just as a housekeeping note, the Lakers did on um, Tuesday put out a medical update on Taylor Horton Tucker, who had thumb surgery. Um, he is going to be reevaluated in four weeks, is what the Lakers said which is a little bit shorter than I think some of the presumptive timelines that people had been speculating. I had seen more six weeks. I'd seen potentially six to eight weeks of, of like recovery time. This does not mean that THT will be back and playing. It could be in four weeks, they'll be able to know it's going to take four more weeks. It could, but so I'm not, I don't want to get ahead of that. All I'm saying is there is at least the potential there that they're even going to bother looking in four weeks that he might, it might be a shorter timeline than at least I thought. So we'll talk Thursday about the potential impact on the rotation. Um, and maybe a little bit more too about what this starting lineup that we saw on Wednesday, which could be the lineup that they run with. If guys are hurt, at least at the beginning of the year, what it means, why they might do it and why it's preferable to starting Deandre Jordan. Um, so we'll do all that and we'll see everybody Thursday.